Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Real world, in every world, Jeff Krasnow. Jeff is, oh my God, how do we even start? Mm. I'm going to read your bio first, and then we're going to go into it. Jeff is the founder of Wanderlust, first of all. He's also the founder of Commune Media, which is an online learning platform for personal and societal well-being. He attended the Hotchkiss School, I didn't know this, by the way, and received your BA in 1993 from Columbia. So you're a little older than me? Is that true? Well, let's see. I was born in 1970. No, we're exactly the same age. Yeah. Oh, my so gosh. date yourself. We're going to be 50. That's right. This year, very close. I, I believe right at about the same time. I think you're just slightly my elder. Just ah, slightly. I mean, just in, chronologically. Of course, you're psychologically and intellectually my superior by probably a century. I am not sure about this, friend. Oh, I'm not sure. Well, in an hour, we'll know. Maybe. Maybe we'll know. <laughs> I've also just learned that you, you serve on the board of Pure Edge, which is a nonprofit dedicated to integrating yoga and mindfulness curriculum into the public school system, which is stunning. I didn't know that about you. That's true. I'm, you know, I'll be honest that mostly I go to those board meetings and nod my head and say yes. A lot. But there have been times where I've actually contributed to the mission. And the woman, Chi, that runs that organization mm. is astonishing, brilliant. Mm. I call her the Chi EO of Pure Edge. She's, oh, that's awesome. Her name is Chi. Of course. She's amazing. They're doing great work. If I know you, which I, I pretty well do, you're contributing a lot more than you say. But let's let's move forward. You were a part of Super Soul 100, Oprah's Super Soul 100, which I didn't know. How did that turn out? Well, I always call myself number 99. I, um, I, I could have said that. I yeah, just, that. There, there weren't numbers given out. But given who else is on that list, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm number 99. I get it. And uh, yeah, it's brilliant to be included. And, you know, I don't know why, but... I am fortunate enough to be on some email list that goes out to those hundred people and do get invited to some absolutely unbelievable um, events, um, which have uh, which have led to like really beautiful relationships. Like yeah. I was Danielle Laporte, who I'm sure you know. There was some photo op. And she, we were all like balanced on crates and um, Oprah was sitting actually right in front of us, kind of in the middle in the center, of course, where she should be. Mm -hmm. And Danielle and I, we had never met before. We were precariously balanced on these two melt crates and sort of as if to create some sort of like proper layering for this photo op. Mm -hmm. But it was so precarious and and if we had fallen, it would have been probably the worst experience of our lives. Because who wants to fall on top of Oprah during okay. a photo op? Nobody. Okay. And uh, I looked up at her because she was on a higher melt crate than I was. And I said, hey, are you Danielle Laporte? <laughs> and then she said, yes. And then we became great friends. So oh, that's that. How nice is that? We've actually never met she and I. Hmm. But eventually, someday, I'm sure we will. Yeah. You share I'm, a common sparkle. Yeah, she is very sparkly. I want to talk about commune because I think that's, you know, of all the things, we started Wanderlust together. This was going back 10 years um, when you first said to me, I want to I want to put together musical acts and massive yoga classes. Would you 
be interested in being a part of this? And I was like, sure, I think so. <laughs> that sounds like a really good idea. And that started an entire movement that has long outlasted all of the initial ideas that we ever had about it. Can you talk about your experience of that a little bit and what you feel has been the best result of that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it didn't make much sense to many people, um, which is why I'm so grateful to you, because you were one of the few crazy people that understood the idea of, you know, yoga, music, nature, yeah, um, inspirational talks, wacky sustainability concepts on the side of a mountain, you know, as you know, and you took a, you took a chance and I've always been grateful for that because, mm-hmm. you know, it wasn't, you know, we think about the yoga lifestyle now, you know, as encompassing all of these different facets of, I suppose, what would constitute the mindful life, you know, sustainability and organics and yoga and mindfulness and meditation and spiritual and personal development and potentially now more mindful political involvement and civic engagement. But back then, those things didn't kind of natural, that wasn't a natural elixir, right. you know, to try to actually explain that those things all wove into a, a greater kind of tapestry of active life choices was pretty foreign, mm-hmm. you know, for, for Skylar and me, that was just the way we were living our lives. And so I was like, well, let's just celebrate that and immerse in that and, you know, try to find, build community around these ideas that we felt were very salient um, to both personal wellness and to the well-being of society, society at large. But, you know, honestly, I was just... um, and I still remain, honestly, a torchbearer for other people's ideas and bravery and courage. Hmm. You know, Skylar, you know, with you in 2002, you guys, I believe, both started your lower Manhattan yoga studios right about the same time. Correct. Um, February of 2002 after 9-11. Yeah. And... You know, I don't know your story as intimately as I know Skylar's, mm-hmm. uh, since we've been together for 32 years. I can't even um, deal with that, first of all. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Tell her That's I love so, her. A lot of brings around that trunk. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that you were both inspired and motivated by this idea that creating a gathering place to sweat and connect was essential to healing and Mm -hmm. to helping people rediscover their spirit, their faith in life, their creativity. And so really, you know, I got just a front row seat to witness that beauty play out in front of me. And, you know, Skylar opened Kula very close to ground zero in in my office building uh, or right. in the in the building that I had my office right. and so you know I just um, I always had a lot of sort of progressive socio-political beliefs but it wasn't really alloyed with well-being and yoga and meditation until then and um, mostly my experience with that that then bent the arc of what I did with my life um, you know, what I got to witness was when people engage in deep connection with open hearts, you know, it can change, it can change the world. And so in that tiny little humble yoga studio, you know, before there was an equinox on every other corner or a yoga studio on every other corner, you know, you and Skyler both started these really beautiful, humble little places that ended up meaning so much to so many people and created such legacy over long periods of time. And strangely and kind of wickedly, um, 9-11, which inspired you guys to start 
Vera and Kula, um, which was the last, I guess, kind of global crisis, at least national crisis, um, gave birth to Kula, and COVID-19 oddly shut it down. So there's a, right. a strange book ending in that. Um, right. But, uh, but that experience there was incredibly motivating for me and planted the seeds of, you know, what would become Wanderlust, what would become Commune, and honestly, what would become sort of my spiritual, personal journey. You know, I feel like watching you, you were always kind of off to the side, but you were always kind of around during those times um, at Kula and watching you sort of distance and take your idea and, and make Wanderlust happen was one of the things that shaped, I think, the wellness world as it is right now, for better, for worse. I think that the the way in which yoga teachers became figureheads for mm. certain aspects of wellness, for better or for worse, happened primarily and, and a lot because of Wanderlust, not primarily, but a lot because of Wanderlust. And all of the ensuing collaborations between musicians and yoga teachers happened, I feel, because of Wanderlust. There's a lot of thankfulness in this because I've gotten to work with like, for example, my collaboration with Above and Beyond, it turns out that Pavo was watching one of my Wanderlust speakeasies <laughs> when he got the idea to do a spoken word with his music. So all that to say, thank you for following your nose because you ended up creating um, an entire genre. And what I really want to ask about is, how do you feel it's played out now? We are in June of 2020, COVID sort of, we don't know if it's over or just starting again. We are in the middle of a massive societal wake up around our history since the 1600s, the genocide, the oppression, the subjugation, the slavery, all the atrocities that have gone on that we learned question mark in school question mark but we really didn't question mark yeah and what does it mean now is my qu like all of that that huge arc what does this mean now what do we do now in the wellness space yeah well many layers to that i mean i would go kind of back to the early part of what you were talking about and yeah i mean my parents were both teachers um, and my wife is a teacher. It's actually kind of remarkable that I'm not smarter <laughs> than I am, but <laughs> given it, but, um, but I always had a tremendous amount of respect for teachers and, um, and I loved the idea of creating sort of quite literally a bigger stage for teachers and using some of my strengths, which were coming from the music industry production and, you know, sort of, uh, in, I was not, I had no trepidation around sort of building stages around on the sides of mountains and, and, you know, with lights and sound and, you know, kind of a professionalism that I don't think had existed up until that point within the kind of yoga wellness space. So that was always, that was very gratifying to be able to provide a bigger stage, um, for yoga teachers and just to create that experience where teachers were celebrated and um, in the same way, I guess, almost like a rock star was celebrated. Now that has had both positive and, and negative ramifications with yeah. some hindsight. Yeah, I agree but, with that. But, um, but I do think that, you know, the role of the teacher needs to be respected and remunerated. And in some ways, I, I think that we help to create some bigger platforms for teachers. Yeah, I think always in every kind of assessment or survey that we did for Wanderlust um, of, you know, what was special about your experience? You know, why did you come to Wanderlust? 
uh, invariably over a 10-year period, it was always the community. The relationships, I think the thing that I, I most fondly look back on and even relish and am proud of in this moment mm -hmm. is all the beautiful relationships that were fostered and built over yeah. that 10, 11 year period. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways it became a bit of sort of like the Hajj <laughs> or the Kumbha Mela for, for yoga and the, and the yoga industry. And, you know, in the United States where, you know, people would all come and they would, it was almost like what the most beautiful piece of it was what happened in the spaces, all of the innovative entrepreneurial ideas that were born between classes, all yeah. the teachers interacting with each other, kind of people who had deep respect for each other, but rarely got to see each other. That's right. Um, That's so that true. That was magical. Um, yeah. And then, you know, really all the small stories of the marriages and the babies and, mm. you know, um, that came about over those years. Um, it, or, and still, you know, I still get a lot of that anecdotal stuff back that really is heartening and, and warming. Mm -hmm. And I feel very, very close and proud to that. Mm. I think that, um, you know, as kind of I turn my eyes a little bit towards the political, one of the frustrations, to be honest, that I always had with Wanderlust was the cleavage between the personal and the societal and you know from the very earliest days i had my little mini franchise i suppose within wanderlust which was called mindful america and you know i was always trying to drum up marianne williamson and sean corn and you know carrie kelly and a lot of people that had were really committed to the concept of alloying spirituality and politics, spirituality and civic engagement, I would say even more. And, you know, it, it just wasn't, it didn't take, you know, people, I think, and this is a, a generalization, but for until recently, I suppose, until 2016 and the election of, the, of our current president, people really f felt that their wellness practices, um, their spiritual and somatic practices were really were their own sacred space, really distinct from society and the world around them. And, and in a way, people, I think that, that the world of politics became so crooked and and dirty and sully that people wanted a sacred space to escape to away from all of that and um and you know that's very different than the role of kind of that that many of these modalities and practices played like for example in the 60s when mm -hmm. um when a lot of people progressively minded people were starting to discover Eastern religions and integrate yoga and meditation into their lives. Right. But, but that was very, very connected to the civil rights movement or the anti-war movement. It was like, you know, we'll do this, you know, I mean, Marianne Williamson actually said this to me once we did the I Ching in the morning and then it was an anti-Vietnam war rally in, in the afternoon. Right. And people saw these things as, as very connected. And I think that now there is a rediscovery of that again, that there is a straight line between one's own personal well-being and the well-being of the world around them. And that those things cannot really be divorced. No. That, and that's, you know, and I'm, I think we're talking just for some context on June 10th, you know, 2020. So we're kind of right in the crosshairs of a very intense social time, as, as you pointed out. And what I am seeing and feeling at protests that I'm going to, and certainly, you know, on the internet, 
um, on social media is this outpouring of people really wanting to give and to support. Mm. Um, and it's clumsy and people are scared of making mistakes. But I think those folks that are really out there, earnestly out there, sometimes stepping in a bucket of shit yep. are, I think that there's some grace for that. And, uh, and I, I think there is an understanding again, that our personal spiritual practices can no longer be just personal. Right. I think the, um, the clumsy aspect is where I want to pivot because mm -hmm. we, I feel I have a responsibility now as a white woman in this space, I have a responsibility to, like we said before, learn as much as I can about what wasn't taught to me, learn about 1619 and how it all began right there on that ship, learn about what's happened since then in terms of all the presidents that I seriously I was under the impression that these were well-intentioned humans who have who have created a farcical veil for so many millions of people to look at and think they were doing such a good thing, the quote unquote war on drugs, and start to practice mass incarceration of black and brown bodies. These are things that we need to talk about in wellness, I feel. Some people might not agree. If we are going to move forward and sit in front of people and say, this is what you can do to feel better about things. Take a deep breath, move this way, put your body into this position, then take a deep breath and see how that feels. Feel your lungs, feel your kidneys, feel all the little levers and pulleys and, and, and hydraulics in your body. I don't feel like I can continue to teach that without in some way acknowledging at every turn, every day, the fact that this has sat in the nervous systems of people of color for as long as they can ever remember for generations prior. And for us to have the nerve to try and teach any class at all without an acknowledgement of that, the taxation on that nervous system that that person of color has had to live in two worlds at once their whole lives. That I think is really foolish and careless. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to fix it. I don't know what to do next, but I do know that I'm not going to stop talking about it, teaching about it, learning about it so that I don't feel clumsy. I want to feel like I know what happened and I'm fucking ready to really talk about it and ready to own my complicitness in it. Yeah. 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 I agree. I think many people are going through a self-realization that they can be innately good people and completely complicit in structural racism, period. And, you know, as you point out, the history that we think we know and that has been taught is not the whole story or the true story. Um, you know, I think that that is step one is finding really credible resources and diving in, mm -hmm. um, with, uh, without, you know, being afraid and, you know, to be honest, just like living in, in some considerable discomfort, you know, that is grounded in really acknowledging, as you say, one's complicity in systems and structures that have, that have absolutely terrorized and oppressed a people. And then, you know, there is, there is like a question of like, well, what can you do? You know, what can you do kind of right now and I, and I think that that can be that question can be somewhat you know overwhelming paralyzing for for some but for you know teachers that do have platform 
you know, I, I agree. You, you need to use those platforms to help give people the resources they need to become active and civically engaged and mm-hmm. connect their personal wellness to the well-being of society. And, and that can start with, you know, education. That can start with giving time, giving money, really sitting in deep listening deep moral inventory. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, certainly that's where I am. You know, I'm kind of uh, kind of walking a tightrope of evolving in public while learning and, um, and just trying to be, you know, really honest and, and vulnerable and then humble and support, you know, support those around me and use my platform to tell, to tell stories that haven't been told. I think that is actually the best use of us. If we're considering ourselves vessels or voices or platforms at all is to let the stories that haven't been told be told. Hmm. I like that plan. Yeah. I'm actually really nervous. I'm interviewing Kiese Lehman after this. I'm <laughs> dying dying you have to have him on your show if you haven't read his book heavy it's insane okay i will in the one of the best books i'm not kidding i'm such a snob this is one of the best books i've ever read heavy yeah it's changed the way that i see writing hmm. yes as much as any i don't know danny shapiro is one of the ones who changed the way i write um my God, Maya Angelou changed the way I write, but this man, wow. Mm. When you read this, you're going to weep many times over. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking for right now is, yeah, just to, to learn. And, you know, like you, I tend to express myself most clearly in writing um, and, uh, and kind of, that's where I find myself as that conduit for the higher spirit. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like being able to sort of improve your own writing, your own ability to be that conduit. There's nothing better than reading. Agreed. Um, Agreed. So, yeah. I was just telling Jonah that I'm going to install a reading program this summer based on reading Kiese's book. His mom used to make him read and write every single day. And he would be writing on all kinds of diverse topics. And I feel like I've been a little lax in actually creating that for Jonah. So I'm going to do that this summer. We're going to have writing workshops, he and I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And my children are, well, I have three. And so, and they don't resemble themselves or at all, um, <laughs> either physically or in their patterns and habits. And so I have one incredibly bookish daughter who just loves to read, Lolly, and then two that I'm going to have to <laughs> arm twist a bit. Um, <laughs> so maybe we can share some... Uh, Michael Bones. Some, yeah, right. Yeah, she's uh, She'd rather just be in front of the camera all yes. the time. Bones, so, of course. So we'll have to share some techniques, both reading list and then some techniques for that reading list to actually <laughs> go to some real use. I have a feeling we're going to put heavy in front of Jonah first, actually. Mm, okay. Kiese started right. It, it starts from the voice of himself as like around 13 or 14 in Mississippi. And he was born, I think he must have been born the same year because some of the references are exactly what we know. Uh, really obscure 1970s and early 80s references that, you know, nobody would know right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, um, my kids, we've been going to, you know, some of the protests and, Mm -hmm. in, and marches in, in LA. And we went to one in Hollywood last, um, last Sunday, which Mm -hmm. was quite large. It was like 20,000 people. And, you and I'm writing about it now um, because it is I mean they call it Holly weird for a reason lovingly like the local 
denizens yes, yes, of Hollywood. <laughs> because, you know, because right alongside, you know, Koreans for Black Lives and, you know, LGBTQ for Black Lives and every imaginable group for Black Lives, there's also like Spider Man for Black Lives and, oh, wow. you know, a bunch of superheroes dressed up um, uh, because, of course, it is Hollywood. And, um, it was uh, it was an interesting experience in a lot of different ways because this kind of twisted moment, kind of tightly packed twenty thousand masked people together in a viral pandemic, right. you know, which I support is I suppose is a reflection of of the depth of the of the frustration, right. um, but it, it also from just a pure experiential level gave the whole thing sort of a feeling equally of protest march and Mardi Gras or something, because, you know, there you have drums and people chanting and everyone wearing masks. So it was kind of like surreal. And, you know, as of course, like the march got going and we got moving and, you know, the chanting and the singing and this call and response got kind of more intense and beautiful and one it was it was impossible not to have kind of this spiritual feeling this sort of epiphany of not just equality but but of oneness right. you know that um and of course like the real human experience is light years away from that but from in this kind of brief moment, the absolute ridiculousness and absurdity of racism or or any form of separation dissolves and, and dissolves with the kind of illusory nature of self, you know? It mm. just, that's it. You know, you're swept up and away into that ocean. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the reasons I feel like going and participating in mass gatherings, although I respect everyone's um, choices, concerns around, yeah, and how they can authentically show up. And certainly there are some risks, right. you know, given the fact that there is a viral pandemic. But the, that sense of, connection and oneness the epiphany that comes with that is really motivating and mm -hmm. nourishing yeah so you know it, it is um and just you know exposing my my children to that was was beautiful because they really just it, it's not just something that sort of exists on some screen at that juncture yeah no that's a feeling yeah it's an ocean of feeling and uh there's this, like a, a couple specific moments that really really sprung forth micah who is 10 she's kind of holding her black lives matter placard proudly kind of over her head and there was a car that somehow had weaved its way um into the protest and there was you know, kind of people sitting on the doors of the of the car as it kind of weaved itself through like throwing people water and snacks and i mean this is kind of like what i loved about this thing that's like no one was there making any money you know no mm -hmm. one was there because they didn't want to be there mm -hmm. like there was no commerce there was no margin <laughs> you know there yeah. was just um intent like the intent yeah and like this kind of true like there was also no barricades and not one single person in uniform and it was kind of like wow interest yeah interesting i mean of course surveying from helicopters overhead and you know i'm sure there's a good many good reasons for that strategy but right. it was just like people know what to do you know when they're better angels are allowed to kind of spring forth. They just sort of know what to do. Yeah. And it was this car kind of pulled up and this, you know, woman 
African American woman, young, beautiful, um, kind of looked over at Micah, and she's quite diminutive in she and is. ten. Um, she's a little tiny little, little nugget, and um, and this woman asked Micah, kind of, and there was it's loud and you know kooky and crazy, and um, and this woman asked Micah, "How old are you?" And Micah, you know, says ten. No, but you know. she shouted. She goes ten. Exactly, and uh, I know exactly what it sounded like. And this woman said, "What's a ten-year-old doing out here caring about black lives?" And said it in like the sweetest, most <sighs> loving way, <sighs> as if to make her feel seen. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Bones. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it was very sweet. So. Wow. You know, that's the thing that gets me every time is that every single time I turn around, there's some beautiful person of color trying to help us feel more comfortable. And it's so fucking late. We're so late. <laughs> We're so late. Yeah. <laughs> That's what makes me cry right now. Yeah, it's it's. <sighs> I agree. There's um. There could and there is plenty of reason for there to be a tremendous amount of hostility. But what I'm finding personally is that in my clumsy earnestness to address my own complicity that while African Americans bear no responsibility to help me feel comfortable or hold my hand through that or but many are. Yeah. And that is just the distillation of grace. I can't say anything else after that. <sighs> wow. Yeah. And when, every time I see it too, and feel it mostly, especially when I see and feel someone of color trying to help me, all I can do is say thank you because it's been so many years that I have completely missed the boat and missed seeing what that actually is right in front of my face. And if you're white and you're listening to us talk right now, there have been millions of instances in your life where someone of color has done something in order to make you feel more comfortable in your whiteness without you ever knowing it. And that's, I think, one of the first places that we can begin is just to own that and to know that whiteness is not a bad word and it's just like ch chairness bedness <laughs> pillowness yeah. like whiteness and that nobody nobody's in trouble yeah that's right yeah it's just time to do it yeah i mean there's you know obviously the one of the big books that's people are reading right now is that book called white fragility yeah um yeah, now is certainly not the time to be fragile about these conversations or, you know, about our own discomfort in them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, again, like as I, as, you know, one of the things that kind of stuck with me around that, some of the contents of that particular book was this kind of notion that we all feel that we're like good people that, you know, especially kind of in the wellness world and, you know, Oh yeah. You know, we're, we hold ourselves to a high moral standard and, you know, our works and actions are in alignment with our highest principles and all this stuff. How could we be racist? Right. right. When we're that and, that we have this kind of binary look at personal 
behavior mm -hmm. that if you're, you know, if you're good, you can't possibly be racist. And, you know, of course, it's so much more nuanced than that. I mean, you know, I do take a good amount of pride in terms of trying to live an ethical and spiritual life. I've done a you know, good amount of work on that. And I haven't always done that. You know, I've mm -hmm. done some significant personal moral inventories. I've gotten clear on what are these kind of perennial universal truths and values that I hold sacred and that every day I work, I wake up with kind of resurrected, if you will, um, with that opportunity to live in alignment with those principles. And, you know, and that is discipline. Um, but despite all of those things, all of that work, mm -hmm. you know, I personally have, you know, started to take God like a, a look into where do my kids go to school? What, who constitutes that school? What are the businesses that I've known? Who are the equity holders in those businesses? Yeah. Like, you know, real, like look in the mirror shit. Yeah. You know, my beautiful, loving grandparents who themselves were oppressed and believed in the promise of America and its dream and put family in front of their own interest and God were so loving to me. What did they say and utter under their breath from time to time? Like really fucking racist. Yeah. Like yeah. hard shit, you know? And, I remember. and so, you know, so yeah, that, that idea that like by raising your hand and saying, yes, I'm a little bit racist or I am complicit in systems and structures that are racist doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means that we need to wake up and do the work. And um, so that, that was, you know, some of the, the takeaway that I had from that particular book that I thought was, I thought was helpful. At least yeah. it was helpful for me. I think also it's worth noting for any white listener or any listener of color for that matter, just to hear us saying this, but for any white listener, the whole idea of you knowing that you're not a bad person, can you wrap your head around the fact that for people of color, they have had to be reminded of this by a good parent or a good teacher their whole lives? Because all the reminders in their faces, their whole lives at school, sports, everything, was that the color of their skin made them less than, or indeed a bad person in comparison to a white person. That's the fucked up part, that we need to be reminded that we're not bad people because we're complicit in a system and a structure that is completely wrong, backwards, full of lies, murder, genocide, all the, all the most atrocious acts that a human could possibly commit. And that we have to be reminded of that is still a problem. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> no, I mean, it's, it's, um, yeah, I, I think the opportunity, obviously, aside from the tremendous opportunity to address some of the structural and systemic injustices, and, you know, I think we're starting to see. Yeah little glimmers of hope, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, just even around kind of municipal changes and yeah. obviously the defunding of certain elements of police departments and reallocation of funds. And, you know, I think the broad coalition that has now emerged is having some, some real initial impact mm -hmm. and that's incredibly hopeful. I think that there is another layer of opportunity, which is a greater sense of empathy and a sort of a, a reframing of this story of separation that we live in, of this notion that we are just individuals living amongst other distinct individuals in some form of external universe 
not only separate from each other, but separate from nature, you know, separate from the divine. And that's a story that's now kind of been told for millennia. Yeah. And, you know, it informs all of our societal ills, racism kind of at the top of the list, but also the way that we treat our environment, all forms of, in, of income inequality. These things all have their root in a similar place, this notion that we are completely separate. Yeah. And so, you know, I hope that there can be sort of a new story that emerges there too. And, and many times, like that bigger story is based in, you know, the littlest stories. Man, I like, you know, again, when I was walking the kids to the protest the other day, I was kind of like lost in thought as I have been <laughs> over the last couple of weeks, sort of not paying much attention to like what's going on inside me just or around me, just kind of experiencing sort of subjectively what it's like to be me. And, you know, I caught the eye of an African American police officer that was kind of, um, you know, as we were walking there, there is this one precinct and, you know, the police had sort of barricaded around the precinct mm. and um, my heart kind of just lurched in that moment of what is the experience? What is that like to be African-American and a policeman right now? You know, just kind of like I, I just reacted as I saw him and I caught his eye and he looked at me and I, I kind of gave him this kind of very like deliberate salute and kind of <laughs> moved along. But he understood, you know, yeah. what, what my heart was trying to express, which yeah. is like respect. Yeah. And just empathy and compassion of what it is like to be someone else. Yeah. And, and he kind of just kind of gave me this, really kind of gentle, beautiful nod. And like, he's like, I get it, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so it's like these, the unweaving of all of that separation yeah. that happens kind of in those tiny moments, but that the aggregate of the, of billions of those tiny moments that can rewrite that story. Yes. I think that's where we have to go. We have to go. Whew. When I think of, again, kind of get back to that, like, well, what can I do? You know, I'm sitting yeah. here listening to this podcast or whatever you have to be doing, that you can take responsibility for the human condition, that you can be an active participant in it, through the smallest of things and through the biggest of things, but it will always be the aggregate of all the small things that then really bend the arc of history. And I think that that is an empowering idea yeah. that we, you know, so much of the time the world shapes the self and and in order to actually understand who we are, we need to look at like, in what ways does the world shape the self? And what, how does, what are the forces and the voices that imprint our soul and our identity? And how do we unwind those things so that the self can better shape the world? And I, I just think that through sometimes the smallest actions and connections, we can start to do that. We can start to shape the world instead of being shaped by it. I don't even want to speak after that. And I think, I think the only other thing I would possibly be able to add would be that if you are listening to this and now feeling some sort of semblance of agency that you could have a hand in this healing, 
with the smallest action, keep learning, keep talking, keep sharing, keep asking questions, keep of yourself, of all of the ways in which you show up in the world, but keep noticing one thing, one most important thing, that where you feel resistance is the most important action you could take. Like that's the place where you feel like, no, I don't, I shouldn't have to, I don't want to, I don't agree. Those are all pointing you toward a massive evolution within yourself, which is when you can do what Jeff just suggested, which is when you can shape what the world looks like going forward far past our lifespan. Mm. If we're listening to this. Well, you've made me cry three times. Yeah. Yeah. That's just what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. I spend most of my day on some form of pendulum between yeah. kind of tears and kind of energized hopefulness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you so much. I'm so happy that we have this sibling friendship soulship. I really, I really appreciate you in every way. Yeah. No, likewise. You, um, like, I think we, we emailed a little bit about this, but it is a rare gift to mm-hmm. have a friend that you can just you know, that you might not have talked to or seen in a little while, and then you reconnect and you're right back there yeah. where you were. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that's a rare and beautiful opportunity and relationship that we have with each other. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Mm. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the time. And uh, I look forward to our next talk when it will be for your podcast. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. Yeah, I know. It'll be... Uh, I'll have to, I don't know how we'll 